Now part of the Darkcast Network. Welcome to Indie Podcasts with a Dark Side. A woman is found with fatal injuries in her Colbert County, Alabama home. The crime itself was supposed to look like a home invasion gone wrong. But the truth was so much worse than that. 35 years later, this chapter has finally been closed. It's the case of the murder of Elizabeth Sennett, right now on Love and Murder. Welcome, lambs. Welcome to a new episode of Love and Murder, your weekly true crime podcast telling you cases of heartbreak that turn to homicide. I am your host, Kai, and in today's episode, we're discussing a case of a woman who was brutally murdered in her house and the aftermath of the killer's decisions. Before we begin, I want to say that this episode and all my episodes are sponsored by my lambs and Patreon, patreon.com forward slash love and murder. Be sure to subscribe to love and murder right now while you're listening so you don't miss a case. So just hit that subscribe button right now. If you didn't know, you can also subscribe to our Patreon so that you don't have to hear intros like this one or commercials like the ones that are coming up. And you'll get Kyrant's bonuses and you'll be a sponsor of Love and Murder. Patreon.com forward slash Love and Murder. In the meantime, though, grab your butts, grab your BJ's apple juice, murderandlove.com forward slash BJ's, and let's get into some Love and Murder. At the age of 45, Elizabeth Dorleen Sennett or Liz, as everyone called her, was a kind, loving community member and a devoted family woman to her husband and her two sons, Mike and Chuck. Elizabeth and Charles Sennett were married in 1962, and Charles was described as someone who had a big personality and everyone in town knew him. Elizabeth was the opposite of Charles. She was kind of quiet, and even though everybody in town did know her, she wasn't as outgoing as her husband. Her family described her as someone who held the family home together. At the time of this case, she was a grandmother and loved the joys that life had thrown her way. Quote, Ma was just a homemaker, kind, nurturing. We were with her every day growing up. We never missed a time with her and daddy, her son Chuck said. Now, on March 18th, 1988, Kenneth Eugene Smith and John Forrester uh, and John Forrest Parker arrived at the Senate House. Elizabeth was home at that time, so they told her that Charles had allowed them to come here to survey the grounds for hunting. So Elizabeth called Charles just to make sure that this was right, and he said, yeah, let the two men in. So the men proceeded to walk the grounds to look around for hunting purposes, and Elizabeth stayed inside her house. After a while, the two men knocked on the door and asked her if she could use the bathroom. And Elizabeth, being the kind person that she was, said yes. While John was in the bathroom, Kenneth snuck up on Elizabeth and started hitting her. Of course, Elizabeth fought back, and as she struggled, Kenneth used, quote, a fireplace set, a walking cane, and a piece of galvanized pipe to beat her with. Later, John came and joined Kenneth in beating Elizabeth. After Elizabeth was beaten, she was then stabbed eight times with a survival knife in the chest, in the face, in the neck, and in the scalp. And it was these stabbings that caused her to die. Can you imagine she was still alive through all of that beating and then through the stabbing? Later, the sheriff's office received a call from the Senate residence. The one who answered the call was the secretary of the sheriff, and she said that there was a screaming man on the phone. She couldn't even understand what he was saying. So Sheriff Ronnie May took the phone and calmed the person down. And that's when Charles told him that he had come home to find his wife lying in a pool of her own blood. Quote, all we knew was the pastor's wife had been killed in what seemed to be a home invasion. So police were dispatched and Sheriff May was one of the first people to arrive on the scene. When he got there, he checked for a pulse for Elizabeth, but he couldn't find one. But shortly thereafter, emergency services arrived and they were able to find a pulse. And when he told Charles that we found a pulse for your wife, expecting him to be excited and hopeful, Charles instead, quote, almost fell. So Sheriff May was like, and he definitely took note of that. 
Sheriff May then rode with Elizabeth in the ambulance because he wanted, like, as soon as she woke up, he wanted her to tell him who did this to her. However, when she arrived at the hospital, doctors said she was dead. Sheriff May is quoted as saying, quote, she fought it and she fought hard. You feel for the victim and what they went through and the horror she went through in her last minutes. You feel for the family and the range of emotions, including pain and anger. You see the horror and disbelief in their faces. Now, because of the glass of a medicine cabinet being shattered and it looked like a video cassette recorder and a stereo had been taken, initially investigators thought that this was a home invasion that was probably like interrupted. Maybe Elizabeth stepped in while the thieves were in the house. So that's what they initially thought. However, upon further investigation, they thought that the home actually looked staged to make it look like it was a home invasion. Basically, all they took was that and the crime scene was still really clean. Then, later on during the investigation, Sheriff May remembered something, something weird. He actually remembered meeting Charles. He remembered meeting him a few weeks ago. He was investigating another murder, and this murder was the shooting death of a service station owner near Cherokee. And while they were in the store, Charles came in behind a rescue squad member. And Sheriff May told him, you can't be here. This is a crime scene. You need to leave. But Charles kept coming back inside the store. So this got Sheriff May to thinking was Charles trying to check out what investigators would look for so that maybe he can stage a crime scene? So then they started really looking into Charles and they found out that he had just gotten a life insurance policy on Elizabeth. The only problem is he had an airtight alibi for where he was when the murder took place. They did note that he did have mental health issues in the past and... During their investigation, they did find that he was having an affair. On top of all of this, they found out that he was having financial issues as well. Now, if that wasn't enough to really bring him in for questioning, during some interviews of people who knew the family, it was reported that Charles told everyone that he was unhappy in his marriage for several years and wanted to get a fresh start in his life. Then... To really set the case over the edge, investigators got a call from Crime Stoppers. So it was an anonymous call. And that caller gave them some suspects names. They said that Charles had contacted one of his tenants named Billy Gray Williams and offered him $3,000 to have Elizabeth murdered. So on March 25th, which was one week after Elizabeth's murder, Charles was brought in for questioning. During the questioning, he denied any involvement in the murder of his wife. Quote, the better part of an hour, and he just denied and denied. So after that hour, they let him go. And as he stood up to leave, one of them made a comment. Like they were thinking that it was, it was really, it was staged, but they had to make it look like they were thinking. So he, the investigator pretended like he was saying it out loud and he was like, Hmm, let me tap a pen so I can get into character. Hmm. I wonder who this Kenneth Smith is. And then they looked up and they said, quote, he Senate went beat red. When Charles left the interrogation He went to his church and at the church, he met with his sons and their families because right now they're adults. And he told them he was having an affair and he told them he had their mother killed. Quote, he said, I failed a lie detector test. I've been involved with somebody else. We're taking all of this in and I can't believe it, Mike said. Then after telling his sons, he walked outside to his truck, got in the front seat, and shot himself in the chest. When Sheriff May arrived at that scene, he jumped in the ambulance and also rode to the hospital with Charles, you know, hoping that he'll come to and start talking. However, when he got to the hospital, he was declared dead. Quote, lost both of them in seven days. One doesn't know how much you can take until you go through something like that, says his son, Mike. So now investigators got a search warrant for Kenneth Smith's house. 
in the house, guess what they found? They found a video recorder that belonged to the Senate's. Remember that recorder that was missing? Yeah, they found it in Kenneth's house. So they brought in Kenneth and they brought in John. And both of them sang like a bird. They both provided information about the death of Elizabeth and said that Charles hired this guy named Billy Gray Williams. Like I said, who was one of his tenants. He told him, you murder, your, you murder my wife, you'll get $3,000. Billy said, uh, yeah, I'm going to call Kenneth Smith and John Parker to help me with this. And he said, I'll give them each 1000 to do this. So split the 3000 They also said he did this because he was having an affair and he didn't want that to get out. So the you know community would look down on him. And he also wanted to collect this insurance money so that he could pay off his debt. Now, my question goes back to if you don't want society, your community, your children, whoever to look down on you, I think you can come back from having an affair because you could always stop and say, hey, I screwed up. I made a mistake. I do want it to work with your mother or still, hey, I screwed up. I made a mistake, but I want to make it right and divorce your mother and stop cheating on her and lying to her. So you can come back from that. You cannot come back from murder, I think. Like that would be a hard thing to forgive. You murdered my mom. You know what I'm saying? But a lot of people think that they're going to get away with it. And I guess, you know, some crimes get you, some crimes people get away with, but why don't you assume that you're not going to be one of those people? How about you assume that you're not going to kill your wife or have your wife kill or hire people to have your wife killed or whatever, husband or wife, brother, sister, mother, whatever. How about you just not do that? and deal with the consequences of whatever issue you you started. Just deal with it. You can always fix it. As for the debt, you can literally just stop adding to it and find a payment plan to pay it off. Like all of that is still better than murder. So Charles gave them money beforehand to buy a gun to kill Elizabeth. However, Kenneth and John decided that, well, we want drugs instead. So they went ahead and bought drugs with the money, the money that was given to them up front to buy a firearm, and they decided to use a six-inch survival knife to do the deed instead. And then they just figured what, whatever was in the house, we'll use that there. So they were both arrested, and Kenneth was tried and convicted in Jefferson County. And the reason why they did this was to reduce like pretrial publicity. They just wanted to get it done and over with. The jury found Kenneth guilty of the murder of Elizabeth and recommended to the judge that he be executed. So before 2017, the jury wasn't the one doing the sentencing. They just did recommendation. And if fewer than 10 jurors voted for the death sentence, then that would be a life sentence. But the judge didn't have to listen to the jury but it just kind of like swayed his opinion on what he was going to do. So even if they said, hey, we recommend this, he could say, okay, well, this is what I'm going to do anyway. So the jury voted for execution 10 to 2. So the judge agreed with them and Kenneth was sentenced to death in 1989, but the conviction and sentence were vacated on an appeal in 1992. So then he went back to trial and the jury in his second trial recommended life by a vote of 11 to 1. And the judge said, no, we're going to do death. John was also sentenced to death and Billy was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. So after more than 22 years on death row, 42-year-old Parker was executed on June 10th, 2010. And they did his execution by lethal injection. His last words were, quote, I'm sorry. I don't ever expect you to forgive me. I really am sorry. And this was a quote he directed to the two sons. And then he turned his head and looked at his family and said, quote, I appreciate everything. You all know that I love you. And then he was executed. 
Billy ended up dying in prison in November of 2020 from an illness that nobody has told us what it is. So it could literally be an illness of a shank in his spleen, but they just wrote down undisclosed illness. Kenneth, on the other hand, kept appealing his death sentence. And by November of 2022, he exhausted all of his appeals. He was initially scheduled to be executed via lethal injection on November 17th, 2022. Even though he did have a motion to stay his execution, but it was pending before the U.S. Court of Appeals for the 11th Circuit. At 7.45 p.m. that day, a lawyer for the Alabama Department of Corrections emailed Kenneth's lawyers to let him know that they were preparing him for the execution. We don't have anything in writing and we're moving ahead with this. So Kenneth spoke to his wife and at 7.57, the guards hung up the call and then they took him to the execution chamber. At 7.59, the 11th Circuit issued the stay of execution. So he got off by the hair of his chinny chin chin. I want to pause here just for the commercial and say thank you to my lambs for listening to Love and Murder. Now, if you'd like to support me more and help me keep the content flowing and get access to exclusive bonus episodes, you can join my Lamb Supporters Club today. This season, I actually give you multiple ways to join. You can join through Patreon, you can join through Spotify, and you can join through Spreaker. The link to each of these are in the description below, and your support means so much to me. Either way, if you join my supporters club or if you're a lamb listening to the free episode, thank you for being part of the lamb podcast journey. And speaking of journey... You can journey your butt right over to BJ's to get your BJ's apple juice. I told you about that apple juice before. Now, for you to take advantage of the benefits of BJ's, which is saving money, and in this economy, you know we got to save money. Everything's going up in this economy, but BJ's prices are so affordable. And for you to be able to get these features of features of BJ's, you do have to become a member. However, I do have something special for you. If you join BJ's today using my link, you get $35 off of your yearly membership. So if you get the basic membership, that's only $20 for the year. Now, I keep telling y'all that I joined BJ's. I would not recommend something that I'm not a part of. I joined them in 2022 just to test it out. And they got me hooked. They got me hooked. I'm still a member. I keep refreshing my membership every year because the prices are so affordable. You cannot imagine how much money it saves me. And if you're thinking, well, I only have a small family, then that means your stuff will just last longer. You'll probably only have to go to groceries once a month. I only have a small family and I use BJ's. And I am not staring y'all, and I am not staring y'all wrong. Join BJ's today, murderandlove.com forward slash BJ's. Use my link to get $35 off of your first year's membership, murderandlove.com forward slash BJ's. And now back to the show. So even though they did get the stay, they didn't tell Kenneth and they didn't allow Kenneth to speak to his lawyers. Instead, they kept him strapped to the gurney in the execution chamber. So he was there at 7.57. They received the stay at 7.59. And then at 10 p.m., so he was laying there that whole time, the execution team came in and attempted to place an IV in his arm. At around 10.20 p.m., the United States Supreme Court lifted the 11th Circuit stay of execution and the execution went forward. So while they're putting the needle into him, Kenneth is telling one of the members that you're sticking this needle into my muscle and not into my vein. And the member told him, yeah, mind your business. I'm not doing that. You're not a medical professional. Are you? No, you're not. I'm not sticking it into your muscle. I'm sticking it into your vein. The team then moved him to like a sort of an upside down T position and then left the room. When they came back, they injected him with, quote, an unknown substance while another team member started stabbing. And I say stabbing because that's what it said. I'm, I'm really thinking jabbing him in, in the collarbone with a needle because he was trying to place a central IV line. Where the hell are you trying to place his IV line? I thought your IV goes into your arm. Anybody in the medical field, let me know why, why they were trying to put it in his neck. I mean, I know you have your artery there and I know you have a bunch of veins in your neck, but I really thought IVs go in your arm. Do they put IVs in your neck sometimes? 
So after they stabbed him up a bunch of times, at 11.20 p.m., his execution was called off. After this ordeal, he was in, unable to walk or lift his arms on his own accord, and he was also hyperventilating and sweating. Now, I don't know if I feel bad for him. If he was in the hospital, like if this was Elizabeth in the hospital and this was happening with her, of course I would feel horrible and I would have a whole rant about this. I don't, I don't know if I feel bad for him. Like, you stabbed a woman eight times. You're literally getting jabbed, not stabbed. So I, I, don't, I and I know y'all are probably going to look at me like weird or whatever, but I don't think I feel bad for him. It is what it is. Look, you're all crying because you're getting jabbed by a needle and you just beat a woman and stabbed the mess out of her. You're lucky it was just a needle. Quit your bitching. That's how I feel. Anyway, this botched execution marked the third consecutive execution by the state of Alabama by 2022. Third consecutive Wow. So after this third consecutive botched execution, Governor K. Ivey ordered a review of Alabama's execution process. He also asked that the Alabama Supreme Court amend state court rules governing death warrants and to allow the Department of Corrections personnel additional time to carry out executions. On January 12, 2023, Alabama Supreme Court approved this amendment. Now, fast forward. And Kenneth's execution made the news because he was going to be executed now via nitrogen poisoning, which is a new method of execution, which is something I didn't know because I don't follow the death sentence. Experts said that killing with nitrogen gas could cause the person unnecessary pain. And they said could be, quote, even described as torture is what they said. I mean, stabbing a person eight times and beating them with a pipe and a, and a fireplace poker could cause unnecessary pain. So that's all I'm going to say. <laughs> so although Kenneth's botched execution was not able to go through, they put in another death warrant and it said he was supposed to be put to death on January 25th, 2024 by the nitrogen hypoxia. During his wait for his execution, Smith had an interview with the online publication, The Guardian, and he told them that he wished, quote, he had done things differently. One second, one moment in a man's life, and that's been the only incident. I've not had any incidents with officers, not a single fight with inmates in 35 years. Violence is not who I am. How do you go from not doing anything to going zero to 60 in 2.5 seconds to murder. You go from, I'm very clean, squeaky clean to murder. That's crazy. He also said, quote, I've been in prison for 35 years. How have I not been punished? 35 years. I have not gone unpunished for 35 years. I have suffered doing this. So has my family. Yeah. So has her family, her, her, her family, her, for 35 years, your family got to talk to you. They got to come to the prison and talk to you. They got to, I don't know, have kids send you drawings or whatever. But for 35 years, Elizabeth's boys have not had anything, nothing. We're supposed to feel sorry for you. Is, is this what you're going for? I'm just wondering if we're supposed to feel sorry for you. And when they asked him if he was ready for his execution, he said, quote, I am not ready for that. Not in no kind of way. I'm just not ready, brother. On January 10th, 2024, a federal judge ruled that Alabama could proceed with this type of execution. And so between the 10th and the 25th, Kenneth kept putting in appeals, 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 and the Supreme Court kept saying, no, fuck you, no, I don't want to hear it, shit on yourself, no, absolutely not, put this away, throw this down the toilet, shove it down his throat, we don't want to hear it. So while this is going on, activists and the United Nations were concerned that using this never used method of nitrogen gas might lead to, quote, cruel, inhuman, or degraded treatment, or as they say, even torture. His lawyers argued that this was unconstitutional and that they shouldn't do a second execution attempt because they tried it already and it was botched and he survived. So clearly just leave him at life in prison. 
However, her sons were like, no, I agree. Go ahead. Whatever you want to do. We don't care. Kill him. Quote, they didn't ask mama what method she wanted. He just did it. So why are we having to sit here and go through this with him? He's been alive and in prison twice as long as I knew my mother. These were quotes from both Chuck and Mike. So like I said, he's sitting here like, oh, I've paid my debt, my debt to society. I've been in here 35 years. Yeah, they haven't seen their mother in 35 years. And like Mike said, he's been in pr- he's been alive and in prison twice as long as he even knew his mother. On January 25th, Kenneth's final appeal to stave off his execution was rejected by the Supreme Court. And his execution was scheduled to be carried out at 6 p.m. Kenneth ate his last meal of steak, hash browns, and eggs and got his final visit from his wife and sons. See, your sons, your sons got to visit you. For 35 years, they got to visit you. And again, I'm not saying this against his wife and sons because they had nothing to do with it. You put this on your children and your wife. You put this on your family, on your mom, your father, your brothers, your sister, and whoever else loved you. You put this on them. But you cannot forget that you also put another family through this. You put the Senate boys through this. And the father, that was his fault because he's the one who started all of this. But you accepted the job. So the nitrogen gas was administered for 15 minutes. And it appeared that he died 10 to 15 minutes after he was given the gas because at 8.08, he stopped moving. Some of the witnesses said that it looked like he was conscious for seven minutes and that, quote, he thrashed violently on the gurney, breathing heavily for several minutes before his breathing was no longer visible. The curtains to the witness room were closed at 8.15 p.m. and he was later pronounced dead at 8.25 p.m. His last words were, quote, tonight, Alabama causes humanity to take a step backwards. Thank you for supporting me. Love you all. I mean, would you have rather been shot? Would you have rather been stabbed eight times? I'm just wondering which one you would you have rathered? Would you have rather been beaten with a fireplace poker? You're looking for sympathy and you murdered a woman, beat her. Can you imagine how long you beat her for? And then being that she was still alive when she was stabbed eight times, you're looking for sympathy in the wrong places. I agree. Maybe they shouldn't have tried an experimental new drug. That's crazy. But you were also appealing your first death sentence. So now this is just a second reason to appeal your second death sentence. Again, I'm not saying that, you know, they should have tried an experimental new drug. That's freaking crazy to me. But you're not the one who should be talking. It should be everybody else. Activists and stuff like that. And not that they're talking for you. It's just the situation like, no, we shouldn't be trying experiments on humans. But that's not advocating for you. So if I was literally one of the people advocating saying like, you shouldn't be testing this out on humans and you were like, yeah, thank you for supporting me. I would literally slowly turn my head and stare at you and ask you if you're kidding me. I'm not supporting you. Alabama Corrections Commissioner John Q. Ham said that Kenneth's convulsing and shaking appeared to be involuntary movements. And he's thinking this was based on, you know, the nitrogen hypoxia. He also said that Kenneth held his breath for about four minutes, which then led to a stronger response in his body. How do you hold your breath for four minutes? I don't think he held his breath for four minutes. I think he held his breath for a couple seconds and then breathed in and held his breath again. I don't think he held his breath for four minutes. State Attorney General Steve Marshall also said that the nitrogen gas was, quote, effective and humane method of execution. But a party on Kenneth's side described the execution as, quote, the most horrible thing I've ever seen. Governor Ivey said that justice has been served and he hoped that the Senate family could find closure after this execution. After the execution, Michael said that justice had been served and that Kenneth deserved to face the consequences of his crime. He also said that even though his mother couldn't be brought back with the death of Kenneth, he was happy that this ordeal was finally over 
and also added that the family had long forgiven Kenneth and everyone else involved. Quote, nothing happened here today that was going to bring mom back. Nothing. We're glad this day is over. All three of the people involved in this case years ago, we have forgiven them. End quote. In conjunction with this experiment, I guess, his remains were released to the Escambia County coroner for an autopsy. Volker Turk from the United Nations High Commissioners of Human Rights condemned Alabama's use of the nitrogen gas and stated that the method itself had amounted to a potential form of what he said is torture and degrading punishment. After Kenneth's execution, though, several other states started thinking about it. States such as Ohio, where the last execution was in 2018, they started thinking to legalize nitrogen gas as a new method of execution. And that is the case of the murder of Elizabeth Sennett. What do you think about that? As usual, you know, I would love to hear from you. And in today's poll, what I'm going to ask is, do you feel sympathy for Kenneth? Basically that he had a botched execution and then he had to do this experimental execution. The answer options will just be yes or no. You felt sympathy for him or you didn't. I don't feel sympathy for him. That's my answer. But I don't think that they should have done a test on a human being. That's where I stand. So where do you stand? I'd love to hear your thoughts. And speaking of your thoughts and polls, let me read what y'all said about the last full episode. So if you remember, the last full episode was the disturbing and shocking murderous case of serial killer Sheila Labar. So the question was, if you were a juror on this case, would you have said she was insane? And 100% of y'all said, sane, guilty. And then some of y'all left the comment as to why. Black Ivory said, this episode was wild, crazy wild. I felt the passion in your podcast. This woman is not human. She should be dissolved like salt. Well, damn, Black Ivy. (laughs) Um, Christina Bobo said, I say guilty. I do believe her upbringing played a significant role in her becoming a serial killer. However, she knew better which I completely agree. She knew better. Like, I don't, there's not many people who turn into this that I can say like, okay, let's blame your upbringing. There's a lot of people who could literally get help. You know, right from wrong. You know, when to do something, when not to do something. You know, when it's becoming like a little bit too much for you to bear, you need to run and get help, something like that. And she was way too smart for you to say, Oh, well, let's say insanity. No, she was planning and plotting. So that's why I don't buy it. She continued on. Also, please don't stop your polls. Okay, I won't. I love them, but I never see them on Spotify. Even when I listen the same week, the episode was posted. So I just come here. And by here, she means in the after the podcast Facebook group. So if you want to join my private Facebook group, you could actually find the link in the show notes below. She continues. It gives your listeners an opportunity to engage. And I love that. I also love that you engage with your audience. Sometimes I find myself talking back to my computer. Hopefully more people tap in again. Yeah, I understand, Christina, because I talk to my computer about four days a week. I'm just sitting here staring at my computer, looking at the squiggly lines as it's recording and pretending that y'all are sitting out in front of me. But honestly, don't sit out in front of me because I'm an extreme introvert and I'm really, really shy. And if you were sitting in front of me, I would probably like throw up and then just stare at y'all and then walk off the stage. (laughs) It would be a horrible experience. (laughs) And then she also said, based on my quote, when I said, I don't even know who Starsky and Hutch is, which I don't. She said, seriously, neither do I. But when you said it, I honestly pictured your description. Look, when I said Starsky and Hutch it, like seriously, I just saw that the 70s show where you just slide across the car, which I totally want to do that one day, but I'm not that rich because you know it's probably going to scratch the paint. And they get into the car and then they speed off. I, you know what? I meant to look up Starsky and Hunch, Hutch. You know what? I'm going to look it up right now and y'all are going to look it up with me. So let's look up Starsky and Hutch because I meant to do it after I recorded and it's like, Once I'm finished recording, I need to go like put my brain on a mental pause. True crime, like y'all don't understand the reading, getting my research together, reading what happens. Oh, 
the pain I go through. And I'm not taken away, obviously, from the pain of the victim's families, because I know my pain is not anything like theirs. Like, it's not even comparable. But the pain I go through reading this, whenever I finish recording, I got to get up and move away from my computer. Like, so after I finished recording that, I went to decompress. So I forgot to look up Starsky and Hutch. But so I don't forget, let's do it while we're on the episode right now. Oh, it's a television show? I thought it was a movie. Really? Oh, it was a movie. Okay, so it was a television series and a movie. Okay. Streetwise detective David Starsky partners up with a more intellectual partner, Kenneth Hutch Hutcherson, to protect citizens and patrol the streets of Bay City. They get their inside information from flamboyant bad boy Huggy Bear and spar with their no-nonsense boss, Captain Harold Doby. These names, though, are, are killing me. <laughs> These names of with Huggy Bear? Wait, what? They're flamboyant bad boy Huggy Bear? So apparently it's a show that started in 1975 and the final episode was 1979. So I guess I heard people saying Starsky and Hutch, so that's where it came to mind. I have literally never seen these people before in my life. In my life, I would have never known who any of these people were. Ah, and then Ben Stiller and Owen Wilson remade it in 2005 or whatever. So, I mean, the movie, I know who they are. Ben Stiller, uh, Owen Wilson, and then Snoop Dogg played Huggy Bear. But the 1975 version, I have no idea. But at least now we know. The more you know. So on a previous episode, I got some more comments. So the episode of Jasmine Richardson, Titty Lope. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm, I'm five. Don't mind me. Titty Lope Life Life. I can't get through saying your name. I can't do it. Titty, titty love. I'm trying. I'm trying. Oh, okay. Grow up, Kai. Grow up. Okay. <clears throat> Adult Kai here. Titty lope lives. <laughs> Whatever. We're going to bypass this. This person said, I don't agree with wiping her record clean. I'm pretty sure that they can still dig it out federally. I don't agree with, with wiping her record clean either. That means she like literally just got away with it. And look, TL, if that's your real name, I'm so sorry for laughing. I'm very immature. My daughter could tell you. She's a teenager and more mature than me. I laugh at everything I can make anything to, into a joke. So if that is your real name, then I apologize. Please don't be offended. If that is your made up name, well done. I give you a stand in O. Well done. And that is all I have for you today. Please go and answer the poll question. And don't forget, share this episode. That is a free and easy way you can help me out. Share with your mom, share with your friend, share with your dog, share with your brother, share with your sister, share with your dad, share on your social media mainly. So just hit that share button and share on your Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, X, whatever it's called. Share, 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 share. And as I end each episode, say it with me now. Let's say it all together. What Like one big happy lamb family. All love. And no murder, y'all. See you in the next episode. Bye. Hey, you thought I forgot, didn't you? You know I ask this of you every single week. If you could just take five seconds and give me a five-star review on whatever platform you're listening to me on, that would be so greatly appreciated. I know I ask you this every week, and sometimes you listen, and sometimes you don't. Please hit that five-star button right now. And if it asks you that you have to say something, just say, Lamb, Lamb family, we're awesome. I love this show. See, I gave you what to say. Just Hit five stars and just submit. Thank you. Bye. Do you love true crime and traveling? Having traveled the world solo the last couple of years and being obsessed with true crime, I found myself researching others who took the same vacations but never made it home. 
The Last Trip is a true crime podcast covering missing and murdered people that were living their best lives on vacation. I'm your host, Jamie Beebe, and each week I'll bring you on The Last Trip, taking a deep dive into vacation culture and travel spots, tips on staying alive while traveling, and ultimately recreating someone's last days in paradise. What led to their last trip? And could you be next? Kiara Henry vanished from Maui, Hawaii while traveling solo, and after extensive searches, there are still no leads. Did she meet with the wrong person, fall into the ocean, or simply walk away from her life? Elijah Snow and his wife were celebrating their 10th wedding anniversary in Cancun, Mexico. Elijah was last seen on camera walking up the steps to his hotel room, only minutes after his wife got in the elevator to also go to bed. He was found dead the next morning, beaten and stuck in a window at an abandoned neighboring resort. The Mexican authorities said it was an accident. His family said it was murder. Join me, Jamie Beebe, co-host of the popular true crime series, Strictly Stalking, as I embark on a brand new adventure combining true crime and travel. Listen to The Last Trip wherever you get your podcasts and follow The Last Trip on Instagram at The Last Trip Crime Pod.